So at the end of the talk, we will call on people to ask their questions using their own voice. But if you prefer, you can also ask your question anonymously. And in this case, I will read the question for you. So with this, I will hand over to Hun Jung to introduce our speaker. Okay, thanks. Eliana. It's my great pleasure to introduce Professor Yushe, whom I have known many years by now. Uh, professor Yushe is a professor of sociology at Princeton University and has a faculty appointment at the Princeton Institute of International and Regional Studies. He's a director of, uh, of the Center on Contemporary China at the university. He's also a visiting chair professor of the Center for Social Research at Peking University. Before joining Princeton in 2015, Professor Shi was faculty member at the University of Michigan for 26 years, most recently as O.T.S. Dudley Duncan Distinguished University Professor of Sociology, Statistics, and Public Policy. Professor Shi is a member of the American Academy of Arts and Science, Academia Sinica, and the National Academy of Sciences. His main uh, area of interest are social stratification, demography, statistical method, Chinese studies and sociology of science, among many others. I would probably need a whole colloquium for myself if I really introduce the papers, books, and other major achievements that Professor Shi has made. So rather, I'll actually go that direction. Let me stop here and actually ask you to join me welcoming Professor Yu Shi. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Hinju, uh, for the introduction. And uh, thanks. Uh, uh, your also would like to thank your colleagues for having me to give this talk. Uh, let me see. Let me share my screen. Can you see my screen? Hello? Yes. Uh, yes. yes. So, okay, yes, great. Yeah. So the, I'm going to present a paper that's forthcoming in American Journal of Sociology. Uh, my co-author is uh, Hao Dong, uh, or Dong Hao in, in China. And uh, Hao is uh, in the audience, so um, uh, he may answer questions uh, later uh, in the uh, question and answer session. So I will introduce him then. Status exchange in marriage has long been of interest in sociology. So let me define what is status exchange in marriage. It's a marriage pattern in which one spouse compensates for his or her disadvantage in one status dimension with an advantage in another status dimension. In the US, for example, sociologists have studied status race exchange. And in particular, the black husband may have higher social status and he marries a white wife in, uh, in exchange of his uh, highest social status for her racial, higher racial status. Two recent debates, one in ASA, one in AGS, exemplify the controversial nature of the conventional log-linear modeling framework. So I'm going to question the widely accepted assumption that log linear modeling is the right method of choice for the study of status exchange marriage. Many of you know, and I'm, I'm sure Hinju knows, actually he made a t-shirt on my kind of uh, contribution to log linear modeling as a methodology. I co-authored a book on log linear models with Dan Powers. So I have been contributing and using log linear models in my work. But in this paper, I want to question log linear modeling because I no longer think that log linear modeling is the right approach for the study of status race exchange and indeed the status exchange marriage in general. So I'm going to question log linear models. Why is log linear model long considered the standard method for the study of status exchange in marriage? Because 
Lagrini models has been thought to meet two methodological needs. One is balancing distribution. The other is to identify exchange. For simplicity, let me give you some notation. Let's consider two characteristics. One is G, group membership, such as race. The other is status, say, in our example, will be education, S, so G and S. And you have a subscript H for husband and subscript W for wife, for both of them. Let's consider race and status exchange marriages. In that, um, for that, to study that topic, we consider four types of marriages. White, white in-group marriages, white, black intermarriages with a husband being white. You have black, white intermarriages with, um, uh, with a wife being white. Uh, the first one is the uh, wife is black. The second is the wife is white. You have black, black in-group marriages. Both are black. And I'm going to show you one of the problems and one of the uh, purposes of log linear models is to balance the unequal distribution of status of husband when husband is black or white versus uh, wife uh, distribution of status of wife when wife is different is either white or black. And also between the two uh, different types of marriages either inter marriage or in-group marriage, the distributions of status could be different. So log linear model was used to control and to even out unequal distributions in status across those groups and marriages. Let's take a closer look at log linear model. We're dealing with four-way cross-classified cross frequency table. We have subscript I, J, K, and L. I is for husband's group G. J is for husband S status. K is for wife's G. And L is for wife status. It's a complicated table because it's a four way table. I break down the log linear model terms into five lines. The first line, mu one to mu four, represent the terms that represent the marginal distributions of the four variables, nothing more. The second line, mu one, two, and mu three, four, represent the marginal associations between G and S, both for husband and wife. What is that? That for in our example, whites may have a higher status than blacks for both husband and wife, that's all. It's a association between group membership and status. And line three, we have two terms, mu one, three and mu two, four, represent the marginal association between husbands and wives in G and S. This, that is, you have racial homogamy and educational homogamy. Blacks are more likely to marry other blacks and highly educated husbands are more likely to be married to highly educated wives. So those are known facts and they are beyond the scope of status exchange. Then line four, we have extra parameters, different researchers was adding line four and there's a disagreement as to what should be included as controls in line four. They have line five, line five are parameters, high level interaction parameters that are intended to capture status exchange. How do you do status exchange? Usually you have two methods, two options. One option is to add interaction parameters in line five to capture status exchange, high level interactions, four-way interactions. Alternatively, you can also compare observed frequencies to predictive frequencies on the model of no status exchange. You can do the ratio 
and the, when the ratio is much greater than one or smaller than one, you say there is evidence of status exchange. So what will be four-way interactions? One particular way might be the difference in status multiplied by difference in group membership. So that's a particular form of four-way interaction. I don't know about you, I've only written few articles using log linear models. I've wrote, only written one book on log linear models. But as authors of log linear model articles and a log linear book, I'm confused by this model. My brain's limited. Hinju's brain is more less limited, but I'm, my brain's limited. I can deal with log linear models, but not that complicated the model. It's beyond my ability to understand what is going on. I think it's not only too difficult for me, I think it's difficult for most readers of those articles and reviewers, maybe authors themselves. It is highly parameterized, high level interactions and, and people disagree as to what should be included in line four, which model should be accepted out of class of models. And I think the whole literature breaks down Especially you also need to choose the right model. And when you choose a model out of many possible models, there is always an element of subjectivity. There is no standard that's widely accepted the standard as to what model should be chosen out of many competing models. So to us, there is a need for better methodology. If we wish to make advances on the literature, we need to have a better methodology than log linear model. Log linear modeling is broken for this case because the issue, at issue, we have high dimensional interactions and we have infinite number, almost infinite number of possibilities and the researchers will reach different conclusions depending on how they specify log linear models, what to include and which models to choose. So we go beyond the conventional log linear model. And in log linear model, you model marriage of frequencies and to indirectly identify status exchange. That's a log linear model approach. But we think we should give that up and instead we replace it with a new methodological framework for studying and quantifying status exchange directly. So we move from indirect method to direct method. We want the quantities that can speak to the question, research question of status exchange. And that's what we will do in this paper. Okay, I hope I'm not going too fast. So in order to do that, we propose to redefine status exchange as a treatment effect. And of course, we use the language of treatment fact from causal inference literature. Indeed, we borrow methodological tools from the causal inference literature, even though we do not necessarily believe intermarriage is a treatment. In the causal inference literature, a treatment is an exogenous shock that produces the causal effect on the outcome variable. For in the marriage, it is possible when a marriage forms, partners take multiple attributes, including your race, your social attributes together into consideration. So you cannot really separate cause and effect, G and S, one as a cause, one as the effect. That doesn't seem to be possible. But still, it doesn't, even though intermarriage is not true treatment, we can still borrow the methodology of covariate balancing in cause of inference for our research question of status exchange. So we are going to do, I'm going to show you how we accomplish this. So this is the framework. Under the framework, there are many possibilities. We're going to demonstrate the framework with a concrete example 
and in a concrete step of methods, a sequence of methods. Now let's define status exchange as a counterfactual question. We treat husbands and wives separately, focusing on one gender at a time. And there are many justifications for doing that. We think marriage should be considered separately from two sides of a marriage. And so gender asymmetry has been widely recognized and knowing the literature on status exchange, we're going to show you the asymmetry in our results section. So let's start from husband's perspective. For husband agent I, his attributes, race and status are fixed. So husband's attributes, G and S are fixed, but he has two choices. Either he marries someone in his own group defined by G or someone outside his own group defined by G. So those are two potential outcomes he could have. So one is intermarriage, the other is in-group marriage. So for simplicity, we consider intermarriage as treatment and in-group marriage as control. Those are two possibilities. So uh, if husband G is the same as wife G, uh, you have you have you have control. If husband G is different from wife G, you have treatment. In the race and status example, you have intermarriage in the first line treatment, and you have in group racial homogamy in the control group. Those are two conditions, and now we ask question, depending on which one you choose either D equals one or D equals zero, wife's status may be different. So the, the choice of marriage partner, either within one group or outside group, may mean that wife's status might be different. So you have two counterfactuals. If D equals one, you have wife's status, Y sub W one. If D equals zero, you have Y sub W zero. So those are two counterfactuals for the same husband. Of course, a husband cannot marry Y twice at the same time. They may marry twice, two wives, but not at the same time. So at the same time, either D equals zero or D equals one. Either the marriage is with the same race or is a cross race. Either, either intermarriage or in-group marriage. You cannot be both. You cannot do both at the same time. So the research question in the status, status exchange literature can be rephrased as the following research question. If we statistically control for observed differences in the social status of one spouse, in this case, like husband, do we still observe a difference in the, uh, in the wife's characteristics between the two types of marriages? That's a question. For the same husband, will we, will we observe a difference in wife's status between the two types of marriages? Intermarriage versus in-group marriage. Between the two marriages, same husband or control for the differences so that you get the same husband. Would he get different status in wife if he intermarries versus marries someone within his own group? Okay, so that is we using potential outcome framework and treatment effect framework to rephrase the research question. And we think that way we can answer the research question of status exchange directly because we can define equation three. Equation three is delta for an individual's I, husband I, we can ask, is there treatment in wife's social status between a situation when he intermarries a wife versus the situation he marries someone 
within his own group. That's an individual level counterfactual question of equation three. Of course, individual level cause effect can never be estimated, but we can estimate something like average treatment effect in equation four group level. And not only we can do the average at the population level, we can do average at a subpopulation level, such as for white husbands, for example, or for uh, black uh, uh, husbands or white wives and so on. So for any group, we can ask uh, group specific average effects. And here's a, a methodological problem we're trying to solve. Equation four, something like equation four cannot be estimated by equation five due to selection. So in equation five, we have a naive estimator. We estimate wives, average wife status among marriages that are intermarried. And we minus the average status of wives for all in-group marriages. And that is a naive estimator because husbands who intermarry are different from husbands who marry within their own groups. A wife too, wives who intermarry are systematically different from wives who marry within their own groups. So we need to control and this is what Lagalinia was supposed to do. And that's what we're going to do with the causal inference framework is to control or balance out distributional differences between spouses who intermarry versus spouses who marry within their own groups. So that is a statistical issue we try to solve in this, in this paper. What's the solution? Our solution is matching. Matching will give us comparability between the two types of marriages. So we have two types of marriages, intermarriages and in-group marriages. Under the ignorability assumption, which is always assumed in log linear modeling, you don't consider other unobserved covariates. Everything is measured, either status or race, those are measured. So what do we do? For we pick out, single out intermarriage. See, in this case, a black husband and white wife. Then when we compare, we want to know the treatment fact from husband's perspective. And there are two possibilities. He either marries a white wife or he would marry a black wife. So the couple in the bottom in this reservoir could serve as a counterfactual for this intermarriage. And from wife's perspective, she can marry a black person husband, or she can marry a white husband. And in this reservoir of in-group marriages, we can find a couple that matches our wife's characteristic. This is a, a, a white wife's characteristic. And for the husband, we can find um, a couple whose a husband, our black husband can be matched to this particular uh, interracial marriage. And again, you just, you, you, you find from the reservoir of in-group marriages, those husbands, those wives who match those in intermarriages. So standards exchange is specific to intermarriage type. We need to have a theory. We need to start from a theoretical perspective. Then we can derive predictions from status exchange theory as to what to look for. In the case of black white intermarriages, what does status exchange tell us? Status exchange says, because whites have a higher social status than blacks, then blacks husband They will, and, and you have, you have, you have uh, wh whites will have um, uh, higher group attribute. So black husband have a lower group attribute, 
but they have a higher status, social status attribute. So the husband will compensate, will compensate his uh, low kind of group membership status by higher social setting S. And if that is true, then wife, the white wife will be lower in S in social status than otherwise. In other words, if you think about from a husband's perspective, wife status for intermarriage for wives will be lower than wives of the same racial group of black wives. So that will be the prediction from status exchange. Let me say it again, a black husband of high status would marry a white person of a lower socioeconomic status than he would of a black wife. That would be the prediction because he married someone with higher G and he expect a lower S. By symmetry, a white wife, she could marry either white husband or black husband. If she marries a black husband, she sacrifices lower group membership status for higher S status, uh, social status. So for her, intermarriage would mean a higher S. S super one should be higher than S super zero. The counterfactual will be higher. She will gain husband social status than otherwise. So in that way, we integrate substantive questions and define controls and treatment groups. So let's take a look, close look of black husband, white wife, white wife intermarriage again. How do we do that? For black husbands, we compare, because we want to know the counterfactual, we'll compare wife's status between the couple, intermarried the couple, wife, wife versus in-group couple, black, black marriage, that is a black wife. After you match on husband's characteristics, you want to know how he does when he marries a white versus he marries a black person, given that he's the same person in either case. So he's the same person in either case. Either he marries a white wife or he marries a, a black wife will be the consequence in wife's characteristics status. Same for white wife, she has two choices. Either she marries a black husband or she marries white husband. And, and she is not changed, the same person. This is important in counterfactual. She is fixed, given, same wife. She has two choices, either marries a black wife, a husband, or uh, uh, a white husband. And the question is, what would be the counterfactual? What would be the change in husband's social economic status when she marries a black husband versus she marries a white husband? So that's a, a equation 6a versus uh, equation 6b. In the literature on status exchange, people often equalize the distribution of social status by group because wife, white wives have higher status than black wives overall. So many researchers actually want us, I want us, for one reviewer asks us to consider the situation when distributions of wives are equalized between, in, um, uh, between the two groups, between G by G. And that is we considered optional step that we did in our paper and I'm gonna to present to you as part of the four step uh, procedure. So we want to equalize unequal distribution in wife social status by group membership. Again, if you don't do that, white wives have a higher social status than black wives overall. So sometimes that also is being controlled. 
So we consider that as optional step. So let me move on to our four steps for implementing this framework. First step, in first step, actually, this is something I've been working with your colleague, Shi Song. I don't know if she is uh, in the audience. In the first step, we use, we convert social status to percentile ranks. We measure status by relative status, by relative rank and position, relative re status, relative position in the society. We standardize by gender and cohort. We ask, we measure a person's status within rank. This is a, uh, attractive because between men and women, we have the same scale. Indeed, across cohorts, across societies, we have the same scale. We have standardized scale of percentile ranks. So we use relative status. That's the first step. Second step, we randomly sample controls versus treatment so that their status distributions are the same, are equal. Our black and white wives have the same distribution. We do achieve that through resampling. And through resampling, we achieve equal distributions uh, of spouses uh, status distribution. We can also do waiting. Waiting will be alternative. Step three. Step two is optional. Step three is a key. We match controls to treated cases by focal spouse status and other attributes. So focal spouse, in our case, early case, will be either the husband or the wife in the, uh, in the intermarriage. And we match control groups to treatment group by husband or wife, the full code spouse's status. So we equalize the distribution in the distribution, the status distribution of full code spouse, one at a time. We do it twice, both for husband and for the wife. We prefer matching over regression because intermarriages are very selective, constitute a small proportion of all marriages. If you do regression, especially linear regression, you do a lot of extrapolation. You have a lot of cases of no support. So we don't recommend the regression as adjustment. Matching as adjustment is much preferred. We can also account for multiple dimensions as, even though in the examples I'm giving you, we only use one dimension. What do you do? You have multiple S. You just do propensity score. You reduce multiple dimension S by by estimating propensity score as a function of X. So you can still do matching after you estimating propensity scores. And after step three, you equalize status distributions for the focal spouse between your treated group and the control group. Then you can calculate a non-parametric estimator we call EI exchange index. Exchange index is nothing but the average status difference between the other spouse, the non-focal spouse, for the husband being the focal, the wife status is, is being calculated between those who are intermarry and those who marry within their groups and matched to those who intermarry. So this is the treatment of the treated because we take intermarriages as basis for matching. So this is a treatment effect of the treated for those who intermarry. What's the average difference in status between intermarriage and ingroup marriage? So this is basically the average. And we can do that from husband's perspective and for the wife, from the wife's perspective as well. So we have two EI, EI the husband, EI the wife. From the wife's perspective, we look for status difference of the wife. From the wife's perspective, we look at the status difference in husband's uh, S, in husband. And those are the 
um, uh, treated um, uh, treatment effect of the treated estimators. So in doing this, our exchange index approach directly speaks to both classic theories and newly developed theoretical discussions. Recall log, what the log-linear model um, would do. Log-linear model, log -linear models only focus on the odds ratios of inter marriages with or without status exchange. It looks at the likelihood of marriage, odds ratio of intermarriage. Our approach is different. Our approach enables us to directly quantify status. It talks not about marriages, how likely you marry, but status being exchanged. So it more directly speaks to the issue of status exchange and will quantify the amount of status being exchanged. So we link empirical findings to theoretical discussions more directly. So let me move on. Oh, the, finally, we can also examine heterogeneous treatment effects of intermarriage. Intermarriage effect, the amount of being exchanged may differ by subpopulations. And our method enables us to look at variations in treatment effect by S of the focal spouse. Let me move on, I'm running out of time and let me move on to two empirical examples. I will spend more on the first one and spend less time on the second one. The first example is status race exchange. G is race, S is education. It's to be, uh, this is came from the AJS debate on status race exchange. Uh, I'm not going to talk about data, Let's take a look at table two. On the left are numbers from husband's perspective. Observed, and this is from our method. Observed, husbands, this is a white, uh, husbands are black and wives are whites. As you can see, blacks, in intermarriages have high educational attainment that scores, percentile scores are higher than husbands in in-group marriages, they're much higher. And associated with that, wives' social status, those are white wives because they're intermarrying, are also higher than wives in in-group marriages who are married to whites. So you have a huge confounding here because you do observe um, uh, higher social status both for the husband and for the wife in intermarriages. After we do the resampling, after we do the matching, so husband social status is equalized across the two types of marriages. And now you can see that if you focus now on wife social status, those in intermarriages, wife status is lower on average than those in in-group marriages. That is white wives married to white husbands. So here we find evidence of exchange from husband's perspective. And similarly, we also find evidence if you if you don't do this, if you don't do the resampling, you find opposite effects you find the opposite effect, opposite to the theory of exchange. But if you do our matching, uh, rebalancing, you do also see exchange from wife's perspective. That is, that is, if you match our wife's characteristics, then you see that their husbands, black husbands have a higher social status than uh, husbands in white white marriages. So uh, white wives would marry husbands of higher social status compared to husbands who are married to white wives. So you see a status exchange from wife's perspective. Again, you don't see that. It's the results are opposite if you don't do the balancing approach. So we have supportive evidence for both husbands and wife. 
And what's most, more important, more interesting is heterogeneity by one's own status. The amount of exchange being exchanged actually differs by sub, for subpopulations. And this is heterogeneity by husband's educational percentile rank. And this is the um, amount of uh, being exchanged status exchanged by wife's percentile rank. Let's look at wives first. Wives would get more exchange in intermarriage if they themselves have low educational attainment. It's much higher for the lowest uh, levels uh, of education, uh, quintiles of education attainment. The first, low, uh, first two quintiles of education attainment, the amount of being exchanged is large. They benefit more. For husbands, they, they lose, this is a black husband, they lose more in status for exchange, in exchange if themselves have high education attainment. So for husband, if they're more, they exchange. For wife, if they have less, they gain more from exchange. I'm not going to talk more about the second example. This is status and age. Husband will marry a young wife or a young wife may marry an old husband in exchange. And the result uh, is slightly different. We did not find status exchange from husband's point of view on average, but we do find exchange for wife's point of view, and this is due to heterogeneity. So we see uh, exchange for husband only for the very highly educated husband, and we see exchange for um, the first quintiles for wives uh, from wife's perspective. So lowly educated wives and highly educated husband also do exchange. You have a status and age exchange. Uh, that is highly accomplished, highly educated men will marry uneducated younger wives through our approach. If you don't do the balancing adjustment, you don't have the finding. Let me conclude because I'm running out of time. Compared with a conventional logolinear modeling approach, our new approach has several advantages. First, it is simple and easy to implement. It's not complicated to implement. We actually post our, our program on AJS website. So we provide the program. Second, it is flexible in allowing for additional covariates and examination of heterogeneity by covariates. I've demonstrated already that how we can examine the heterogeneity in status being exchanged by one's own social status. For husband, the higher the status, the more he exchanges. And for wife, the lower her social status, the more she exchanges. So exchange is particularly attractive for husbands who have more of that social attribute for wives who have less that social attribute. That makes sense. Economists will tell you, you exchange only when you have access in that some attributes. For highly educated men, they have status exchange. For wives of low education, they won't have more in being exchanged for husband's education. Third, the method is non-parametric. Because it's non-parametric, it removes ambiguity and disagreement over model specifications. We're not modeling frequencies. We're just calculating the amount of status being exchanged. Finally, it yields quantities that are directly relevant to longstanding theoretical propositions by, about status exchange. The quantities about status being exchanged rather than all the ratios of intermarriage versus in-group marriage. It really deals with different quantities. I think our quantities speak more directly to theoretical propositions. Finally, our analytic examples are interesting. Indeed, they suggest that status race and status age exchange patterns are present overall, but are heterogeneous. So this heterogeneity in status exchange may account for inconsistent results from past literature because in the past literature, 
you have different model specifications and different decisions. And then if the patterns are heterogeneous, sometimes you can find a positive, sometimes you find a negative, sometimes you find a no effect. And I think the inconsistency in research findings from the past were contributed by the, uh, the bad method of log linear models. So I have come to a full circle, even though I made my career with log linear models, in my mid-career, I think I'm halfway through, I would like to criticize log linear model as failing to deliver what it promised to deliver. Thank you very much, everyone. That's the end of my today's talk. Thank you very much, Yushi, for this very, very interesting talk. Um, we have uh, several questions, and I'll start with Jerry Berman. Jerry. Uh, hello, you very, very interesting work. I'm not that familiar with this literature. Um, the question I had concern the role of unobserved attributes that might enter into the matching process. For example, um, sense of humor might affect matches, but you may not have observations on sense uh, of, of humor. And um, I'm, I'm not seeing how that affects uh, or is incorporated into this approach. Um, Jerry, the simple answer is that we don't. So we comparing our method to log linear models. In log linear models, that is ignored as well. So we are not making different assumptions from the conventional approach, except in log linear models, you're dealing with categorical data, four-way table, you're limited from considering any other attributes. We can't. So our method is richer than log linear models in being able to incorporate additional measured confounders, not mm -hmm. unmeasured confounders. Unmeasured confounders, nobody can deal with. Even economists can deal with. Uh, even <laughs> Hackman couldn't deal with unobserved confounders because you always have other assumptions when you, when you, when you, um, you need to move to either parametric or other assumptions that are not right. testable. So we're living still with the limitation that we don't have unobserved confounders. However, we are much better with compa in comparison log linear models because with our approach, we can include other measured confounders, say uh, appearance, uh, say uh, IQ, say family background, say mm -hmm. social networks, mm -hmm. uh, say skin color for blacks. So those things could be incorporated in our method that are not possible. Skin color, we're not, uh, log linear model, you don't know how to handle, but we can handle because we can match on skin color because uh, those blacks in uh, intermarriages could have a different shades of skin color. And we can just match by skin color uh, of those husbands to those in um, in-group marriages who are married to blacks. We can do the skin color matching that in a way that's not possible in uh, log linear approach. So we consider there's a much uh, better approach than log linear model, even though we can still uh, uh, not deal, we cannot deal with unmeasured confounders. But okay. it's, yeah, it's I mean, that's, that's very helpful. Now, my, my other small question is, are you scheduled for an interview with Oprah? <laughs> oh, I'm not. <laughs> I actually, I'm, I, no, I don't like uh, TV, I was on TV once. I would like to shy away from media. Actually, uh, the staff at your pop center asked me to have this uh, record and the broadcast. It gave me hesitation because I'm not, I'm not doing well with media. I cannot handle media. No, my answer is no. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you. So the next question was asked um, anonymously. So I will read the question to you. I'm curious what the reception will be of this work. 
Um, if I read your results correctly, they appear to contradict conventional wisdom. Do you expect resistance regardless of the potential scientific validity of the reconceptualization? Uh, okay, I will answer that question. Could we have how done? Uh, let me introduce uh, my co-author at this juncture. How, how are you there? You want to make yourself uh, visible? Um, he received his, his PhD from Hong Kong University of Science Technology, was a postdoc at Princeton working with me. And this is a product of trying to work with him when he was a postdoc. Uh, let me answer the question. The reception from people working on this topic uh, have been very good indeed. Um, so we did uh, get criticisms. Um, we presented the, at a PAA uh, and we got criticisms uh, from our discussant, uh, Kristen Schwartz, as well as encouragement from her. We also received uh, many uh, both formal, informal and through AGS, a good comments. And, uh, very good. So we are publishing this uh, in AGS. So experts on the topic like it because everybody realizes a log linear model uh, is a ill suited uh, for this uh, topic, even though it has been accepted as uh, the method of choice, I think incorrectly. So I think, I think experts like it because it provides a solution to the problem. But others, people outside the field, uh, may not like it. So I just, I, I don't, this, this was, we received desk rejection from ASR. Uh, this was shocking uh, desk rejection, but ASR, we know what ASR is. We know what editorial process at a top journal is like that. So you could have very different uh, uh, reactions. I think uh, uh, editorial decision from ASR came from a non-expert uh, who may pretend to be expert, uh, uh, but this is editorial decision uh, was not friendly, but, uh, but experts uh, really like the approach. That's the answer. This is Hao Dong uh, from Peking University. Hao Dong, you want to say hello to everyone? Oh yeah, hi. Um, it's kind of late for me, but I'm very happy to stay up for important things. Okay, you can direct questions either to me or to him, okay. Okay, you get all the calculations. Yeah, just want to add a little bit regarding the reception. Uh, because honestly, uh, if you're looking at the overall findings of our uh, analytical examples, we are actually in line with a lot of other previous studies. So, what we add is in addition to this simpler method, is also the heterogeneous patterns. It's like, uh, so we our kind of master can uncover kind of heterogeneous patterns. So different people are actually re reacting to this phenomenon differently. So that's what we add. But the overall findings are actually quite in line with most of the previous research. Yeah, I didn't go through. Uh, we actually have a section that replicates earlier findings. So that's one of the things the reviewers, the editors wanted is replication uh, of earlier findings. We did. We do have a ex uh, section on replication. I just skipped that section. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So next question is by Herb Smith. Herb. Um, so I just wrote it, wrote it out here. So once you move to the potential outcomes framework, um, you know, it raises the question about SUTVA, the, you know, the well, stable unit treatment value assumption. But basically, since you're dealing with markets, the assumption that the assignment to treatments are independent is really not so good. In fact, look right under mine, Michelle Guillaume's question also gets at that point. So I'm gonna just stop talking and let you pick up on that because I'm sure you've thought about that. Oh yeah, you're right on. We're ignoring dynamics. This is a, this is a we, we assume so far. So um, we don't consider marriage a market. So what her refers to is dynamics of marriage. A person can only be married to one spouse at a time. If she's married to a black husband, she cannot simultaneously be uh, at the pool be married to a white husband at the same time. So we don't consider uh, marriage dynamics in the in the beauty in other status. You choose the user. It's a you, you have this kind of uh, uh, marriage and you 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 select out 
uh, those are most desirable, then you, you're, you're, you're stuck with uh, uh, the remainders. So we don't have the dynamics uh, at all. It's a purely descriptive. So in the paper, we actually state our uh, index is purely descriptive uh, uh, index. So we do emphasize the descriptive nature of the index. Still, we think it's better than log linear model interaction parameters. So it, it, it's, a, it's an advance in comparison to log linear parameters, even though it still suffers the same problem. Jerry mentioned uh, unmeasured confounders. You mentioned uh, marriage dynamics. Um, in future, we may consider that, but so far we are not considering that at all. So we do acknowledge those shortcomings in the paper. Mm -hmm. That's Thanks. another section in the conclusion. If you read, we do acknowledge exactly the issues you mentioned, Herb. Yeah. Thank you. Michelle, your turn. Uh, Hello. Yeah. Uh, thanks. Thanks you for a very, very uh, stimulating talk. I guess you addressed already the second part of my question. Uh, so about, how about the first part? Could the method be adapted to account for the sizes of the populations at risk, which constrain the actual marriage market? Yeah, I think it is, uh, it is quite uh, important. I mean, actually, my earlier work, I think exposure is very important. Uh, people have uh, different uh, exposures and in different markets, uh, racial composition is different. And also, um, um, again, we refer to uh, Schoen's work. If you think about, uh, it's the same, we're, we have, have the same limitation as log linear models because we're not considering marriage dynamics, especially those who are at risk of being married, those who are single. We don't have uh, single people at all. So those dynamics and two sex problem uh, are problems we have not solved. It's a small step, uh, I think, uh, toward a better conceptualization. But I agree, we are not considering uh, differential exposure, count, local context. We are not considering time dynamics. We're not considering, because of that, we're not considering those who are at risk of being married. So we are not considering those who are newly married dynamics. We don't have all of that. So uh, I hope uh, a better demographers can work with us or improve our work. I don't know, she song is here. I think she is better equipped than I am or how don't uh, to, to deal with those issues. We did consult with her. We think those are very difficult issues uh, of uh, marriage dynamics, but I acknowledge of the, the limitations that you mentioned, uh, uh, Michelle. Yeah, thank you. And just to confirm, Shi Song is in the audience. So she, okay. she listened to your talk. Okay. Um, next question is by Han Ming. Han Ming. Hi, hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hi, I, uh, Professor Yu, thank you for a very interesting talk. I. I have two questions. I think related to what uh, Michelle and uh, Herb asked somewhat. Uh, one is related to just you know the the exchange uh, uh, status you are quantifying. In some sense, is the price you know quote unquote price in the marriage market, mm -hmm. and any price depends on supply and demand. And uh, uh, the supplies of some of the variables are used to, to define status may change, right? The distribution yes. of education among blacks or income among blacks may change. I wonder how would your framework account for these cha possibly changing exchange rates? That's one question. The second one is, you know, you are doing a balancing, I think, try to, I think, deal with something related to just the distribution of uh, among the interracial marriages and uh, uh, within group uh, race marriages may be very different. Uh, but the interracial marriage measure, realized inter uh, measure of interracial marriages may be very small if, for example, the exchange rate is very steep. Very few you know, blacks with a high income can compensate, for example, their, uh, say, low uh, uh, racial status. Uh, and then I don't know how balancing is addressing this issue uh, you know, in terms of interpreting the results. Yeah, um, also very good question. So I think our index is still descriptive, useful descriptive number, even though it may not be, um, it still suffers from selection. So, but you would you can tell you, so, so imagine, I think I understand. Uh, so it's similar to earlier questions. It's about dynamics. Imagine a world 
where intermarriage is very rare. You need a very high social status for black men to marry uh, white women. Uh, another scenario, it's more accepted the cost of intermarriage. Social cost is low. You have a high proportion of black uh, men who intermarry white women. So you have two scenarios and the two scenarios actually suggest uh, kind of in the earlier case, you have highest selection. In the later case, you have a low selection. And in the earlier case, using our method, you will find higher uh, returns for, uh, for from wife's side. You'll find higher returns from intermarrying our, our black husband than the later case. But our numbers will tell you the numbers, uh, the, the difference in magnitude. And that will be the same to Michelle's question, in different social context, you may see different numbers across time, you see different numbers. Those numbers themselves at descriptive numbers uh, indexes are still informative, but you can still say it's biased or because it's subject to selectivity, but that's fine. It's like a few, when few people, uh, I learned from her, but when small proportion of people take GIE, they usually high averages. When a lot of people take GIE or SAT, their average will be lower. It's the same thing, um, but still you can calculate average GIE for the poor of high school students or SAT who take GIE than uh, another state uh, in the poor of not taking GIE. So I think those numbers differences, it's a really matter of interpretation. And the interpretation could be helped by having those indexes than not having those indexes. So I don't think it deals with uh, the selection issue, but it will help you understand both the dynamics nature that earlier questions uh, Herb and uh, Michelle uh, mentioned, as well, the kind of selectivity, how selective in one region compared to another that Han Ming discussed. I think having those indexes will help even though it's not necessarily causal because they are counterfactuals. They, it's not necessarily generalizable. So extrapolation for policy may not be incorrect. You cannot extrapolate from 5% intermarriages to 15% intermarriages. Uh, that extrapolation would be wrong, but I'm not extrapolation. I'm making observations based on observed data. I think for that, the index is still correct. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, thank you. We have one last question that is also somewhat related as anonymously. So I'm going to, to read this. Thanks for presenting this innovative methodology framework. Could you elaborate more on considering the intermarriage as the treatment indicator? As you also mentioned in causal uh, inference literature, the treatment should be poorly exogenous. Naturally, we will feel the intermarriage decision as an endogenous decision. Um, how do you want to answer this first? I will have a break. Go ahead. Well, um, well, I, I think partly you have answered um, because this is highly related to the previous questions, uh, and, and um, we we actually uh, didn't have time to fully um, elaborate that. But uh, in the paper, well, hopefully, if you have time to read later, uh, uh, we have a whole section on that because here. Uh, if we want to claim that this EI, the exchange index, tells us something causal, then that requires a, a strong assumption about ignorability, and, and that's uh, the benefits brought by the matching. But even without that assumption holds, we think this is still a very important descriptive uh, measures, and that provides some um, informative kind of uh, um, summary numbers that can quantify uh, the the. the the social phenomenon of interest to us. So I think in that way, uh, still accomplish what Lagrangian models used to be thought to accomplish. And, and we, we can provide a little bit more uh, on top of Lagrangian models. So that's our kind of advantage by using the new, promoting the new method. Yeah. A very good answer. That would be my answer too. When is the relatively to Lagrangian models, we are not introducing more assumptions. It's the same assumptions as those in Lagrangian models. Second is that uh, we can treat our index as a descriptive measure and being descriptive, I don't think we need make a strong assumption. Those numbers are numbers. They're observed the numbers. We're not over extrapolated them to other situations as causal, as structural. So they are not struck necessarily economics because it's not necessarily, they are not structural parameters. There's just uh, reduced form or observed outcomes. 
Okay, so so thank you so much, uh, Yushi, for uh, giving this very interesting talk. And uh, th thank thanks a lot. And also thanks a lot to Hao Dong for joining the the talk so late at night. Okay. So we really appreciate you both being here. And for our audience, if you have any additional questions, uh, please contact the presenter directly. So thank you. Um, thanks so much. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.